10 most famous outsider artists. And this is, you know, whoever came up with this, their idea. Uh, but we'll just go through this quickly. Some of these, here's a photographer, Miro, Miroslav Tishi, um, and a male. And uh, <clears throat> 25 years, he built up one of the finest collections of photography, pioneering the use of soft focus. Um, as an example, one of his photos, uh, I guess, lived early 19th century, 20th, yeah, early 19th, early 20th century, sorry. Uh, we're going to cover this next man, Henry Darger. Do you recognize that name, Fresh Day? I sure do. Because he's from Chicago. Yes. Uh, yeah, he was a hospital consultant, a janitor, and a uh, strange person, uh, recluse. And, and it wasn't until he died and people got into his house, they realized <laughs> incredible collection of work. The, the Vivian girls, you'll see, he had a whole world going of, of these um, storylines that were over hundreds of these paintings and drawings of the Vivian girls. Um, and there, there's some strange uh, possible sexual interpretations of his, we'll look at that more. And he also had like a, a novel, uh, a, a work writing in progress, 15,000 pages, you know, it's just, it's just this incredible outpouring. And nobody I, knows. Uh, I saw an exhibit in Chicago. You did, okay, works. okay. Yeah. Uh, the story of the Vivian girls, 15,000 pages, the one of the longest unpublished works ever written. All right. So, but look at his in a little more detail. Uh, this one woman I love, Judith Scott, uh, she does fabric art and she's Down syndromes. Uh, she died, but um, she was uh, born uh, twins. And when she, when they realized her twin is normal, but when they, her parents realized she wasn't, they put her in an institution and it was a really horrible place. And her sister had such a bonding with her, the one who's normal uh, for her, uh, she used to go visit her. And then when she became an adult, she got, she got, became her guardian. And um, um, her, her, she was a nurse and lived in California. She said she brought her to live with, uh, uh, Ju Judith to live with her. And then Judith, uh, there's this great center in Oakland, Creative Growth Art Center for people with uh, mental disabilities. And they, it's just all about art. And so for the first year or two, Judas wasn't responding to any of the uh, art that was available to her. Then one day a fabric artist came and did her workshop and she just took to it. And then she is so well known. She's exhibited in galleries and museums all over the world. <laughs> it's amazing. So um, this, he does this, um, things like this and uh, variations that are just a real unique and original fabric art. Okay, so we'll take a look at her. She's, she's a sweetie. And then here is uh, Mary T. Smith from Georgia. And she's created her own uh, kind of backyard art. Um, she's compared to like a, um, a Basquiat in terms of the look of her art. And <clears throat> she turned her small house and garden into what she calls a highly public form of spiritual autobiography. And um, she's gotten quite a bit of recognition too. There she is. And look at her. I guess she makes her own clothes too. <laughs> um, okay. I love it. Yeah. I really love it. <laughs> uh, and then there's Vivian Meyer. Uh, she worked as a nanny looking after. Here's another Chicago artist, uh, Chicago's North Side. She was a prolific street photographer. And she snapped everyday scenes of life in New York. LA, Chicago, 150,000 photos for her lifetime. Okay. Um, but just did it on the side. I'm not going to feature her. And then uh, Adolf Wolfie, uh, he was a Swiss born artist, sexually abused as a child, orphan from the age of 10, committed to a mental hospital institute for molesting children. He stayed there until 1895, from 1895 until his death in 1930. As a result of his unstable condition, he taught himself how to draw, and he became a pioneer in the in the, this outsider art. Uh, they're highly complex, beautiful. There's here's, I guess there's an example of one. He'd be worth looking into. Um, Eugene von Bruen Chen Hein. Um, he's <clears throat> painting, sculpture, poetry, ceramics, photography, and drawing. A real Renaissance outsider. Okay, he used his wife Marie as his muse. He would construct elaborate stages to photograph her on. In his own home studio, he managed to create thousands of disparate works of art and completely unknown until his death in 1983. Um, Madge Gill, we'll look at her, uh, British. 
uh, and then she moved to Canada and her drawings have her drawings and artwork have she's considered one of the best outside artists we'll take a look at her um this would be an example of her work right here but actually the, uh, that's not a really good example she has very complex detailed drawings uh, and her compositions are amazing um george widener is pretty well known uh he's a strange guy he was a, he's like one of those um mathematical genius he worked for this for this uh u.s military intelligence during the cold war and then he made and then um he, he believes his art will be needed for future robot leaders. <laughs> He's really into time and, and expressing dates and obsession, obsession about dates. Uh, I watched a short documentary about him. Um, so here you go. You can see some. He's got. He's got some. He figures out mathematically the connection between dates, and uh, he can just rattle them off. And in this documentary, he's just rattling off these things. He's a genius in like one way. You know, one of those, one of those um, people. All right, and then this man is extremely famous. Anybody out here, Howard Finster? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's uh, from Georgia, uh, a preacher, and he created um, Paradise Gardens in his backyard, this sculpture garden, and also uh, 46,000 pieces of, in the sculpture garden. And he also does drawings. He gained national fame in the 80s because uh, two, um, and we'll look at his short videos on him too, short, uh, two, Big bands, REM and Talking Heads, featured his artwork on their album covers. You're, you may re recognize the uh, um, two bands I really like, particularly Talking Heads. So uh, I remember the album that that one's was a hit. So that really shot him into fame. So Howard Finster is really well known. So those are ten um, that arbitrarily chosen by whoever, but I think it was a good selection. All right, so let's just start with um, looking at and. Um, do, 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 do. James Hampton. Um, uh, James Hampton. James Hampton worked as a as a janitor for the general administration, general accounting administration in D.C. his whole life, and um, he on the side after work he'd be picking up. Uh, discarded objects and trash, and he had some kind of a vision about some kind of a mystical vision. And I've seen this work of art in D.C. It's on permanent exhibit at the Smithsonian. So next time you're in D.C., it's worth going to see this. Right? It's kind of mind-boggling what it is. And this, um, well, let's just look at it first. There you go. Uh, it's this, and it's called the throne of the third heaven of the nation's millennium general assembly, <laughs> whatever that, it's based on some spiritual vision he had. And so it's this, uh, all these different thrones and they look like they could be coming out of ancient Egypt or some, uh, uh, to him, they had all this esoteric, but they're made with uh, aluminum foil, glue, discarded objects, this, this piece, uh, this sculptural piece. We're going to look at a short sculpture of it. Uh, sorry, video. Uh, you can see it's aluminum foil. Uh, trouble is, it's start, aluminum foil and the glue is starting to, it's been deteriorating over the years. It's not, it's not a good um, art. It's, uh, it does, it's not made for permanence. So um, the, the curators are doing their best to restore, it, to restore this thing. Um, so let me pop, let me show. Sure the, Joe, I know sometimes you like feedback. The first, this first image that you showed reminded me of Narayan Maharaj's. Yeah, rock. that's a good Over point. That's great. It does. Yeah, the throne. Oh my God. It instantly. Yeah. It uh, I haven't thought of that, but you're right, Joe. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> who knows what it, who knows what he tapped into? Um, so here's a. But I did see it. It's really amazing. It's like, wow. Uh, and he just he just did this on for years. It took him decades to do it. You know, after work on his way home, he'd pick up he'd pick up things from the street. Um, and what were the years? I'm sorry, I missed that. What were the years that he uh, worked? Is he still alive? I he did, no, I think he's dead. I think he did it in the fifties, fifties. There's a video of it. <clears throat> Is it life size? Wow. Yeah, oh, it's huge. Okay. Or, or oh my the, God. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> 
And Thank this, you, you saw at the Smithsonian? Yeah, it's at the Smithsonian, one of their, I forget which one. Wow. But I did see it. Oh my God. He just had a vision, he said. And it's just. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe he tapped into the fifth plane or something. <laughs> <laughs> but he hardly had any money, so he had to just uh, use um, discarded trash, scrap, and aluminum foil. So. Well, if it was from a spiritual vision, then, you know, Baba said that the meditation of the West is more art oriented, you know, yeah. our meditation. Right. So yeah. that also just really strikes me with this. It's just right. incredible. It's like there's some background plaques on the walls there. Must be some text that goes with it. I'm not sure what it is. I think he went to India in his vision. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. So uh, next time you're in DC, it's worth a visit to see that. Um, all right. Um, the next guy is, is, is French. His name is Francois Cheval, and he he was a postman, <laughs> and then he started collecting pebbles, um, and for 33 years he collected pebbles and stones, and he and this is what he created in his backyard in his yard. <laughs> This isn't a temple in Angkor or a replica of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, but the Palais Ideal, an architectural masterpiece built in the heart of France's Drôme region. It's the work of a postman turned self-taught architect called Joseph Ferdinand Cheval. Cheval built his own myth. He really built an unusual monument that's so unique in the world. The surrealists discovered the Belle Ideal in the 1920s and 30s, and they all queued up to see it. From Picasso to Max Ernst and from André Breton to Jacques Prévert, all the greats came to see it. Every year, 100,000 visitors come to marvel at this huge monument to eccentric forms. It's an unusual but captivating work that always grabs the attention of children. There are lots of different levels. They don't know how he built all these steps to get you upstairs. It's weird, but it's also really beautiful. This building is the work of just one man. <laughs> His fascinating story is lovingly retold Looks like, uh, by Raphael Lambert. India, doesn't it? Every day, he would walk 33 kilometers on foot to deliver all the letters and parcels to the houses at Utrib. Say that again, it's like who? It looks like the uh, sculpture of the work in, it was done in India. It was like Indian architecture. That's true, too. Indian, right? began construction of his palace Somewhere. in 1879 after stumbling across a stone during one of his rounds. He tripped on a stone. It took him 33 years in total to design and build his palace by hand. A building that would eventually measure 26 meters long and stand 12 meters tall. Cheval had no artistic experience. He was a stonemason and he wasn't an architect. He started out as a baker before then becoming a postman. He taught himself little by little the skills he needed to build this monument, gradually building it using the materials he had to hand. Working by candlelight late into the night, the postman slowly erected his masterpiece, stone by stone. Very dapper. A series of tragedies, 
carved his fantasy kingdom in his garden, the expression of his dreams and of his nightmares. His inspiration came from the surrounding nature, but also from distant lands. He reproduced a Hindu temple, yeah. a mosque, <laughs> no, look at that. and buildings from the colonial era. Here, there are lots of oriental details, like, for example, the palm tree and the shellfish. He would have got all these references from the postcards that he delivered in the area. It was that that allowed him to see the world. The postman wanted to be buried in his palace, but the local authorities flatly refused to let him. So at the age of 76, Joseph Ferdinand Cheval embarked on another construction project, building his own tomb in the village cemetery, <laughs> a structure very much in keeping with the style of his palace. It's a fragile monument that the sculptor Pierre Constant and his apprentice Julien work hard to preserve. Here we can see how the postman worked. There, I think it's just a piece of wire. The final form is achieved by shaping the limestone around its frame. That's what makes it flexible, but also fragile. Over the years, the wind and rain have taken their toll on these sculptures. Pierre Constant comes here regularly to remodel them. It's a tricky task made more difficult because Cheval left no notes or tips on how he built them. Every touch we make to restore the tomb is a serious one because we're working on a piece of art here. There's a way to master the shapes and volumes. Ferdinand Cheval had a sculptor's soul without ever going to art school. In buildings and monuments, there are often references, but when it's a personal work, those references come from deep inside. So it's very personal, individual expression. Pierre also works on the upkeep of the Palais Ideal. Back in 1983, he took part in its first restoration project. And even after 33 years, he's still amazed by the postman's achievements. When you see it like this, it looks as if it appeared here by magic, but not at all. It's called talent, and it's not a game of chance. In 1969, France's then Minister of Culture, André Malraux, decided to list Cheval's work as an historical monument. It's a structure that's often compared to the work of the famous Spanish architect, Antoni Gaudi. The link is often made between Gaudi and Cheval because there are some disturbing similarities between the Palais Ideal and the Gaudi Park in Barcelona with its crooked columns. Yeah, there is. A bit where the Gaudi saw photographs of this palace and was influenced by it, or if it was the other way around, we'll never know. Standing, isn't it? And that, is, uh, it, is that a structure that you can go inside or is it just for show? No, you can go other steps that they that they were shown. They can go inside. Uh-huh. Cool. There's a on that Wikipedia list of artists, there's a an Indian man in India has done something similar. His name is Ned. Is I can't read my own writing. Ned Chan, C H A N D. It's called the Rock Garden of Chandigarh. And that that's that's uh, similar. He's done these incredible structures too. So and that's a, a tourist place. So. Uh, all right, it's amazing he did it by himself. How could he have done all that? It's hard to believe. Um, James Hampton um, and having day jobs all of them. Having a day job, right? Exactly. <laughs> James Hampton. He's he's one of my favorites. He's a sculptor. Sculptor. Uh, come on. Why isn't this opening? There we go. Uh, James Hampton uh, was also a what? Was he a janitor or no? That's not. Wait a minute. Hold on. Not James Hampton. That's not who I want. William Edmondson. I'm sorry. My mistake. We already covered James Hampton. Um, where's what? Here he is. Uh, 
William Ed Edmondson, that's him. Um, he was the first Africa, African American to have a solo show at MoMA um, in 1937. All right. Pretty amazing. He was born in 1870s in Tennessee, the son of freed slaves. No formal education. All right. Here's an example of two of his sculptures. Um, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, he's influenced um, modern sculpture. Sculpture, you can see the influence, and 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 incredible forms, and um, and they remind me of it, some ancient stone sculptures you see, like matriarchal sculptures going back. Like he's, he he must have been a sculptor, and <laughs> he just tapped into this, all right. He worked at he worked he worked as a janitor for twenty five years as a hospital. Right? Uh, he saw fruit from the trees in his garden, took odd jobs, and one as an assistant to a stonemason who taught him to carve limestone because these are all limestone sculptures. In nineteen twenty nine, God told Edmondson to sculpt. There it is. That, that's that's a common thing with some of these people. They get they get the instructions or the vision. Uh, <clears throat> He described the resulting forms as miracles and the word of Jesus speaking his mind in my mind, right? As always works were tombstones um, and then angels and biblical figures. He said, God, Edmund said, first God told me to make tombstones. Then he told me to cut the figures. I do according to the wisdom of God. He gives me the mind and the hand, I suppose, and I go ahead and carve these things. Yeah, look at that. Um, he began sculpting popular figures like uh, well-known Eleanor Roosevelt, female nudes, animals. There's a lion. I mean, it looks ancient, doesn't it? It looks like it could be some ancient temple in Egypt or, or Babylonia or something, some ancient Sumeria. <laughs> but they're, it's like a modern version of them. They're brilliant. His methods were, he worked with a sledge. He couldn't afford, you know, sculpting tools. So sledgehammer, improvised tools, chisels fashioned from railway spikes. Um, his front yard became his workshop. He should, and then he lived in Nashville. So word spread through Nashville. City workers began to bring stone to him at no cost. And here's, I can't click on these. They don't really open, but you can see. And I'll go to uh, 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 Google Images with him. He's brilliant. Uh, Art World insiders were inspired by Edmondson. Uh, he was discovered by a neighbor, a wealthy writer who had modeled. Okay. <clears throat> he had no interest in celebrity, except for a short trip to Memphis. He never left Nashville. And he appeared unmoved by the brief fear that followed his MoMA show. <laughs> um, today, his sculptures set records. There's a little bit of Picasso-esque in, in, when you look at Picasso's sculpture. $785,000, million dollars for his sculptures, right? Uh, Joe Lewis, the boxer there. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Do -do. From running low on memory here, got too many open. Images, Google Images. And this. There you go. <clears throat> Any comments on any? On yeah, he himself has an architectonic face. Look at that wonderful. Yeah, he does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. That's fantastic. Yeah. Look at this one. 
That's brilliant, this one. Well... Beautiful, isn't it? You know, these animals, rabbits, lions, ram, doves. What a beautiful dove. Yeah. They, they look ancient and modern at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Time. That's, what I, that's what I think. It's like, um, um, like I said, ancient Samaria or Babylonia, Babylon, you know, or ancient Greece or something. And then, and then modern at the same time. You're right. They have a, a simplicity, substance to them, but just beautiful forms. Um, incredible. There he is. <laughs> so who knows? Maybe these uh, highly accomplished artists from ancient Sumeria, you know, they take birth, they just tap into their memories. Um, could be something like that. All right, this woman you're going to love, um, Judith Scott. Uh, she's the one with the Down syndrome. <laughs> and I told you her story. Um, let's see. I've got a couple of videos on her. Yeah. She is known around the world now. Yeah. I went to a show, an opening for her work in Switzerland in October. Uh, there was also one in, in Tokyo in the summer, in July, and she has another show opening in New York in March. She is renowned because she is incredibly talented, and her work is amazing. Like just the idea that it's a lot about wrapping and tying and sort of things that we normally think of as confining. But yet there's this just amazing freedom in them too. The colors and the wildness of like the different angles of where everything's going and the shapes and the, you know, hidden things inside and things poking out. This is a uh, trailer for a full length documentary. There she is. I feel so I think that our mother and father decided not to talk to me about it um, because I would be upset about Judy being sent to the institution. I woke up one morning and she was gone. And then going to see Judy, it was very frightening because the institution was um, it's like something out of Charles Dickens. That's just an amazing story. <laughs> wow. Incredible. We're at the Oakwood Gallery's Centennial Square location at Judith Scott's exhibition. When you're looking at the works like Judith Scott's, you see that you're immediately drawn to it because of the colors, because of the detail, because of the combinations of colors and the strange shapes. It's difficult to achieve this kind of mass chaotic energy. The shift from a mess to something maximal, something that is full and dense, but not messy, is where technique comes in. 
where the skill of the artist comes into play. With these sculptures, there's a kind of tension bound up, literally bound up, in how they're constructed. You get a sense of a kind of internal energy wound up in them. Scott's works are, in a sense, these kind of mysterious objects. Their origins are obscured. In some instances, they, they peek out. You can see a chair or a bicycle wheel. There's also the aspect of their true nature even being left behind and then turning into something else. One of the great mysteries of art for me and how I'm in awe of artists is their ability to decide when something is complete, particularly when they're working on an abstract level. How did Scott know that these were done when they were done? The way in which they provoke the viewer makes them these explosive catalysts for possibility. This is my favorite one. Oh, is it? Yeah, just because, wow. I don't know, I like the color. You think of sculpture, you think of abstraction and sculpture on Western traditions of representation, animal figures, or totems, math, and geometry, and balance, and harmony. You can also see something of a surrealist sculpture here. These also evoke natural processes or organic processes. The danger with focusing on technique is that you focus on it exclusively, and so it's just a matter of look how incredibly difficult it was to create this thing. You're not simply just looking at the surface as this kind of, you know, boom, there I'm just done, I wound it up, but choices are being made. You're working in unconventional ways, you are open to a criticism that you have no technique, that there is no skill here, that anyone can do it. The answer to that is in part, well, no one else has done it, and that, that she did it in this unique way. We do consider the ability of an artist beyond technique. It's that kind of ability to see something in a way that hasn't been seen before. And when we talk about ability, too often it's the inverse of disability, and disability being an inability to follow a certain set path, to be able to walk up some stairs, or to complete a particular task. But what we find in artists is that rejection of that certain set path, or that expected outcome, and opening up possibility. So the thing that's unique about Judith Scott is that she had Down syndrome. So how this factors into our assessment of her work is perhaps a good question or maybe no question at all. And that can interfere with uh, the wonder of the artwork and its potential and your freedom to do with it what you will. If you're looking at questions of ability, she is able to create something that is beautiful, that has drama, that is mysterious and evocative and tied into a longer history of art making. That's what you see here and the evidence is on the table. Comments on Judas? <clears throat> um, it's amazing the reception she's received. Like I said, uh, she has shows all over the world <laughs> and is represented all over the place. That's incredible. All right. Uh, next from Henry Darger. Um, Wonderful that her sister loved her that yeah, much. Yeah, exactly. Oh but, but, yeah, I know. Was, and that her parents didn't enough to, that they were willing to put her in that place, you know? That's kind of yeah. So um, Henry Darger, he had a pretty, uh, he was strange as a child. And uh, again, he liked, like Judith, uh, he was put in an institution, and he was probably he was he was probably abused pretty badly, sexually, physically, and uh, he ran he ran away several times. He finally ran away to save his life at the age of sixteen, 
and, and kind of walked the last 180 miles into Chicago and just somehow struck, you know, at 16, just probably with nothing and, and ended up with some kind of a, a, a job. Is it, I forget what he was doing, janitor. And then he created this whole world of um, amazing art, drawings and art. Henry Dargan's 31 at Jenny Ritchie is from one of the most extraordinary oeuvre in art history. Daga, a reclusive hospital porter, lived in a small apartment in Chicago. For four decades in the mid 20th century, he secretly conjured up a vast fantastical realm in both words and pictures. His visceral, often shocking creation focused on the adventures of the Vivian girls, seven young siblings who rebel against a force of malevolent adults known as the Glandelinians. His good versus evil opus blended Catholic and Civil War motifs with the colorful aspects of Victorian children's books. The hidden masterpiece totaled 15,000 pages of typed manuscript and several hundred paintings and drawings. It was an epic venture with an epic title, the story of the Vivian girls in what is known as the realms of the unreal or the Glandeco Angelinian war storm <laughs> caused by the child slave rebellion. 31 at Jenny Ritchie is a double-sided work on three pieces of linked paper. Completed at an unknown date, it is executed in watercolor, carbon tracing, and pencil, with descriptions annotated on both sides by the artist. On the front, the Vivian girls are shown hiding in a cave, in an eerie image of foreboding. Jaws are created from the silhouettes of stalagmites and stalactites, while in the distance, wearing mortarboard hats, the Glandolinians slowly advance. On the reverse, the girls feature in two more scenes. On the right, they are seen in revolt, and on the left, escaping across a river. The sequence of three pictures explores the relationship between light and dark, young and old, playful and brutal. Born in 1892 and orphaned at a young age, Daga grew up in the Illinois Asylum for Feeble-Minded Children. It shaped a view of childhood as a period of peril. A skillful autodidact, his Gothic romanticism combined tracing, painting, drawing, and collage. Using Codex Photo Labs, he enlarged and reworked images from his vast cache of magazine cuttings. The figures and faces of the Vivian girls were copied from cartoons such as Little Annie Rooney. In a move that has puzzled critics, some are pictured with male genitalia. Shortly before his death in 1973, Daga gave all his possessions to his landlords, Nathan and Kyoko Lerner, who were shocked to discover that they had become the custodians of an amazing artistic legacy. While Daga's work fits into the concept of outsider art, made by a self-taught maverick, over the years, it has informed mainstream culture, inspiring music, film, and literature. However, Daga's greatest achievement was creating an entire world from his lonely lodgings in the Midwest. I thought it was at $400,000. Some of these. One more. Is this the same one? Hold on. Oh, did I have two of the same? Sorry. Quickly conjured up a vast fantastical. Okay, sorry. You know what first hit me was the tapestries, the medieval tapestries. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, just I didn't know that those were girls. Yeah, and there's some controversy. Well, well, he was uh, sexually abused, so he's working out his own issues. And there's even some some uh, some child was murdered or something in his neighborhood, or and he had photos of her and his and it was um, 
and some people think he was the murderer and there's never any proof linking him to it but just because he had photos of her doesn't mean he did it but there's but so there's and then there's the there's this um the naked girl the vivian girls and some have penis so there's there's some you know um some people go off in that direction about maybe he was just a pedophile, you know, who happened to be talented as an artist and then pedophile murder. I don't know. There's never been any proof, but, but, um, my guess would be he was molested by other men. That's yeah. Got well, yeah. Yeah. What you, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but they're brilliant. The, the artwork is, is brilliant. I mean, um, very complex um story like simple like children's like the art you see in children's book but also very complex at the same time and, and you know has much more profound meanings and like they said light and dark good and evil um if you spend time with it uh, and another uh, thought about you know yeah. what you sh you showed um the images of the murdered girl could have just been yeah. holding on to what you know, helping him to process what he had experienced because being in an environment like that in a prison yeah. Yeah. and being molested is like being killed. Right. You know, yeah, so I can see why he would be drawn to that, uh, that yeah. picture. And it was all in the newspaper. So he had, so that doesn't prove anything, but I don't know if some people went that way. Well, he's, he was the murderer, you know, but there's never any, he was never any evidence whatsoever to link him to it. And though he was never charged, never brought in for questioning and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> People trying to make it had anything to do with the murder, nothing. Yeah, right. So, but they, they have a Japanese quality too, don't they? Don't yeah, these yeah. two for sure. These tell some of these, yeah, the, these like that. So, but fifteen thousand pages of the of this story as well. The Vivian girls, <laughs> these seven girls. So, okay, so he's pretty fascinating. And then uh, last one before we look at the uh, documentary is. Uh, Reverend Howard Finster, cool guy. Um, Paradise, his his uh, his uh, acreage and all the forty thousand sculpture arts called Paradise Gardens, and then um, there's his artwork. Let's see that I do. It's like look one. Oh, maybe I didn't. Uh, what did I did. See. Do, do, do. Nope. Okay, I know where it is. Right. It's here. I'm all over the place. Howard Finster, Howard Finster. There is a magazine, I think it's called, an um, online magazine called Outsider Art Now. And it's contemporary, there's people who are alive and are being shown uh, contemporary outsider artists. So there's that. Uh, Henry Berger, Magic Gill. No, I guess not. All right, so we'll, I'll just go to... Um, uh, Google. Get out of here. YouTube. Howard Finster is really well known, um, probably because of the Talking Heads and uh, the other group. Ryan. I should want him talking. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. Welcome to Georgia Digest. I'm Andrea Berry. From Blackbeard Island, we take you north to Somerville, Georgia, for a story about a man who is a former preacher, banjo player, bicycle repairman, and a very successful artist. We'd like you to meet Howard Finster. God has taken me and lifted me up, and he gave me the kind of art that the people love. That's not Howard Finster's art. 
that's art from wisdom from another world, from God, like following a blueprint. Howard Finster is Somerville, Georgia's self-proclaimed man of visions. He plunged into the art world in 1971 at the age of 55, beginning construction on his Paradise Garden. Discouraged one night after a 30-year career as a Baptist preacher and bicycle repairman, he started looking for a way to get his message across. I've done this little match here in, uh, in, uh, down in Florida on a vacation. I've done these out on the beach looking out over the ocean. Done them on a table with a uh, case knife and teaspoon. Uh, this year is an old-fashioned baseball player. That's my wife, and that's my wife, Miss. And uh, this is an Italian here, and this is an ape man. And uh, this here is a German uh, German soldier, and this is one of the earlier baseball players, and this is a baseball player. The Garden of Strange Beauty hasn't gone unnoticed outside the art community. Howard appeared on The Tonight Show in 1983, and REM and Athens, Georgia rock group made a music video here. All them singers come here and they went through my garden. They loved it. They basically did. They like to come here when they got to go out, get back to England or somewhere. They just want to get in the car and the garden and get on there, some of them trees, lay down the road. And they come. And so we had to make an album cover for them. And it's out on the record now. And people are sending it in to me to autograph. I hate to change the subject and everything, but I, I, there's one last question that I forgot. That's before it's on a totally different note. I'm going to be putting a little piece about REM in the in the story, just showing that they filmed their video here. I was just wondering if you would just tell real quickly how you got hooked up with them, what uh, what how how they become your friends, and you know they. Oh, REM, REM singers come here and they went through my garden. They loved it. They visited it. They come here and put on a big generator and brought in professional equipment here and made a videotape for their songs, and they love that garden. In fact, the business of my garden here in Paradise Garden is sort of a layout. They like to come here when they get wore out and get back from England or somewhere. They just want to get in Paradise Garden and get down there, some of them trees, lay down the roof. And they come, and so they had me to make an album cover for them. And the first album cover I made for them, they put it on on a, a sweat jacket, and the, and the sweat jacket's selling now. I got, I got a sample of one of them up in the church, and I think it done fine with that sweat jacket. And it's got that first album cover that I drawed from it, put it on it. And then they come back and had me to do another album cover, for them, and it's out on the record now, and people sending it in to me to autograph it. They sent it in in a box. One come in the other day on a box that big. The box just bent, and the album was bent. I straightened it up and autographed it and put it back in the box and shipped it back. So. They send them to get an autograph, and some people drive around 45, 50 miles, maybe off the main road, just come get Howard Prince to autograph that uh, a second album cover I made for the R.E.M. And the R.E.M.s are good singers. I play my TV I play my TV all night, long about 4 o'clock. I hear them dudes are singing sometimes. Tapes them singing, you know. And they're really good. They really are. <laughs> I love Howard Finster. <laughs> um, so itchy, scratchy, family not getting clean. Let's see if we can just look at a little more in uh, Google Images. Um, I'm, I'm there already. So before we look at the documentary in just a minute, see what does the backyard really look like. <clears throat> Well, it's not just sculptures, paintings, drawings, Finster, Howard Finster art. Yeah, so you can see the drawings. They're complex, a little bit like Basquiat in a way, like a Southern if, Baptist, if Basquiat had been born a Southern Baptist preacher, he might have done this kind of art instead of born, born a Jamaican in New York City. <clears throat> uh, it's biblical. It has a childlike quality, but also very complex. Like a Santa Claus here. <laughs> Angels. Demons. 
Did he work in acrylics for these? Good question. I don't know what it looks like. Probably did. Or it could have been a house paints or something, you know. I doubt if he worked in oils. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, totally untutored. Um, he liked to use uh, language like Basquiat. <clears throat> There's a Talking Heads cover over here that became well known. Uh, David Byrne from Talking Heads took an interest in him. Yeah, and there's a little bit of uh, Marc Chagall, in a way, right? So if you're ever down there in Somerville, Georgia, you just make sure you pay a visit to Howard Hempstead Paradise Garden, right? So <clears throat> this is just a sampling of some of these well-known people, these outside artists, the incredible, you know, this incredible work in town. Who knows, maybe if they'd gone to art school, they wouldn't have been able to do it, right? <clears throat> so let's watch this documentary. I don't, uh, Cheryl, did you hear me say that it, at the end of this documentary, there's a, a, a real special treat for Baba followers? Did you hear me say that? No, I didn't hear you say that. So I just want to be a little <laughs> cheeky and say, I wonder what it means about me that I really like his painting of devils. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like it too, right? It's well, fantastic. All those red yeah. devils with their pitchforks are all dancing in space. And so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So if you can stick around for this, there isn't anything at 430 on, on Zoom here. Uh, so stick around for this whole documentary. Like I said, there's a really special treat at the end. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is. All right. <laughs> uh, God, I don't know if I can even answer it anymore. What is outsider art? Um, basically, outsider art is. No, I can't remember. I'll start again. What is outsider art? I don't know. You got me. <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out. Um, I certainly been called worse things in my life than an outsider artist. Is that somebody that is working outside, you know, that uh, uh, doesn't mind if it rains or something? And that's plain air, outside. not outsider that's, artist. That's what uh, I would have said. You know. uh, <clears throat> in fact, I was a bit of an outsider artist. I was over on a bench over in Hyde Park uh laying low from the cops at night uh doing drawings and such what, what, what do you mean well i mean uh do you feel like you're outside well i suppose so but i mean but what, what does an outsider what does an insider feel like <laughs> how do you say that name outsider or uh, outsider <laughs> no, i don't know maybe it's for the very planet they present for me Outsider. But whatever you call it, when you see it, you know it. You know, you're looking for things that make you go, oh my God. And that's outsider art. Once upon a time, in the Italian countryside, not far from Venice, there lived a young boy named Carlo Zinelli. Carlo's mother died when he was very young, and he was taken out of school to go and work in the fields, tending to his father's cattle. When he grew into a young man, he joined the army and was sent off to fight in a terrible war. But he returned after just two months, and anyone who knew Carlo could tell that something was very wrong with him. He behaved strangely and refused to utter a single word. They tried to cure him with electricity, but that didn't work. 
And so he was sent away to an asylum with high walls and locks on the doors. And there he would stay, hidden from the world. One day, Carlo picked up a stone from the ground and began to draw on the walls. The nurses stopped him immediately, but Carlo couldn't stop. He wanted to draw everywhere, on anything. After a while, the doctors realised it kept him quiet, and so they gave him some broken old pencil and left him to it. Then one day, a Scottish artist called Michael Noble arrived. He was married to a rich Italian contessa and had come to the hospital to cure his fondness for whiskey. He saw what Carlo was doing with primitive equipment and was outraged. This man is an artist. You must let him create. And so, with the contessa's money, Michael Noble created a studio inside the asylum with good brushes and plenty of paint. Carlo Zanelli may have been unable to talk, but something else poured out of him. The floodgates opened. Carlo spent eight hours painting every day completely engrossed in his work. By the time he died, he had made nearly 2,000 paintings. These works were once dismissed as the scrawlings of a lunatic. Now, Carlo Zanelli's work is on show 70 miles from the asylum at the biggest and most prestigious event in the art calendar. <laughs> It's early summer, and the Venice Biennale is just beginning. This festival is a barometer for the contemporary art world. It reflects current trends. And this year, so-called outsider artists like Carlo Zanelli are the hot topic. And Carlo became very prolific and he started doing more and more work. His psychiatrist then took his art to see Jean de Buffet and André Breton. Carlo's work is here in Venice, thanks to this man, the director of the Museum of Everything. The cross is there upside down, it must be the grave of the soldiers, and that star um, is the star of the Alpini soldiers, which he was conscripted. And you see that star everywhere. Yeah. I think there are all kinds of riddles hidden in there, but I, I think they're just for him. Mm -hmm. From what I know, he didn't care. The minute he finished one, he sort of threw it away. Mm -hmm. And the nurses and doctors would grab them up and quite a lot of them would make their way into their homes. But what happened to this work in the, in the interim? Generally speaking, Carl has been curated by and for, let's say, the outsider art group audience. And that's why it stayed this sort of... Um, Secret, I guess. Well, that secret is now well and truly out. The keynote exhibition here is the Encyclopedic Palace, where self-taught artists rub shoulders with big names from the contemporary art world. Have a look at these. They were made by a 38-year-old man with absolutely no artistic training. This man saw visions and heard voices. In private, he induced hallucinations and then recorded everything in small journals, a process he kept up for 16 years. That man was Carl Jung, one of the founding fathers of modern psychology. Is he an outsider artist? I don't like to distinguish between insiders and outsiders, and that's what this exhibition is about. I've learned particularly from artists uh, that artists are curious about any uh, visual uh, manifestations. And so I wanted to make a show for artists and for the public in which the distinctions between the professional and the self-taught are blurred. What this Biennale does is disrupt the story of art as most of us know it. It brings us back to the most basic questions about the power and the purpose of art. So well, what if there's this inborn urge to be an artist? 
inborn in these guys who had no chance. The thing that I think we look for in art is a kind of urgency, like the artist could not help but do it. And what we have in contemporary art right now is a lot of calculation. Where artists, the artist could, there's no sense of that urgency or necessity. It's fantastic to see here all these artists who were always marginalized until now, and they're together with artists, and this is where they belong, obviously. And by the way, excuse me, Caravaggio was homeless, incarcerated, and insane. And 90% of the <laughs> artists I've ever met are kind of a little insane, so boom. I, I just have to say, I've never seen a Venice Biennale as strong as this one. I mean, for me, it's really, I think this is a, a, a turn in history. I mean, it's a rupture, it's really very important. Some of the best work in Venice is by an outsider artist called Shinichi Sawada. The young man who made these strange and wonderful creatures works in almost total isolation at the top of a mountain in the backwoods of Japan. あの、ほとんど本人。言葉がありませんのでね、こちらもその言葉で、あの、相手を知ろうとしてもこれは当然無理だということで、お互いのその意気ですか、表情ですね。表情でお互いに感じ取ると。それしかないですね、今。はい。
like you. Japanese society expects everyone to play a productive role, whatever condition they may have. Akane Kimura makes 0.8 of a yen, that's half a pence, for every sponge she puts in a plastic envelope. In the afternoon, she draws. And those pictures have been exhibited in museums across the world. その絵を描いた後に興味がなくなっているということは、描いている瞬間をすごく楽しんでいるということだと思うんですよ。書き上がった後それがこう人に認められているとか、それそれに価値がついたとかそういうこと自体には多分ご本人は興味がないんじゃ
who produced over 25,000 pages of drawings, literature, and music in his own inventive notation, all of which he signed St. Adolf II. Dubuffet often had problems finding art because the hospitals rarely archived it. The psychiatric world didn't fully appreciate the value of what their patients were making. But times have changed. Here in the forests north of Vienna lies the art group center, Gugging. Gugging is famous for its house of artists home to 14 psychiatric patients who've been plucked from the Austrian system thanks to their artistic talent. She goes. Unlike the day centers of Japan, these artists live here full time. There is no obligation for them to make art, but still, it pours out of them. So you brought the outsiders inside, and how, how has the art world responded then to that? Uh, in the 80s, it was very difficult, because on one hand, the world of psychiatry didn't understand it. And on the other hand, the, the art world saw this experiment. It was not really presented as art, you know? Uh, so what I wanted to show is that also single pieces of art of every good abrupt artist has the same worth as any other piece, single piece of any other kind of art. If you buy a Van Gogh, you have to pay $200 million. Uh, and then the illness doesn't play any role. So it's the art that's important, is what you're saying. And let's not focus on the, on the case studies. But how, how do you look after the artist then? One thing is the private life of an artist. <laughs> and the other thing is his professional life as an artist. So on the one hand, we supported the artist in their private needs, you know, with illness or whatever, you know. And on the other side, we managed more or less their art. We organized exhibitions, we made publications, and uh, we selected their works because they themselves couldn't select so much. It's, it's the same work as any gallerist works with his artist, wherever. Perhaps the best known Gugging artist is the now deceased August Waller. It was almost as though his creative urges could not be contained within his room and exploded into the surrounding countryside, which he peppered with his work on any available surface. The Vatican has the Sistine Chapel and Gugging has August Waller's old room. Hello, my name is now Pink. I came up just arrived in the village. My name. 
ich mal schon seit zehn Jahren hier und es, meine Bilder sind schon, waren schon zweimal in Tokio, in Japan, zweimal in New York, einmal, dreimal in Paris. Come on, I'll show you a picture. Look it, das ist die Karte auf the Danube, die Donaukarte. Mm -hmm. Das ist vom Anfang, Anfang, äh, von der Quelle bis zur Donaumündung. Der, der höchste Berg von Deutschland ist die Zugspitze, ist 3000 Meter hoch fast. Dann ist da die Donau, die fließt da runter so entlang der die Rolong de Inés, 517 Kilometer. Das habe ich aus dem Gedächtnis, aus den, äh, alles aus meinen Gedanken habe ich das auch Gedächtnis. Ich bin ein super Genie. <lacht> Weißt du, wie viel Euro ich bekomme für so ein Bild? 6600 Euro. Das ist a lot of money. I see we have these images of the artists so on the walls here. The fact that you're selling and exhibiting this work pretty successfully, what impact does that have on the artists? It depends on the artists. Johann Gaber is very aware of who he is. I know we went to Basel uh, to an exhibition in, in a gallery there and we had to fly with the airplane. And then he asked me, Nina, could you please carry my luggage? And I say, how comes? Uh, and he said, yeah, I'm the artist. <laughs> so, so in a way, they're just like all these other famous artists. They're all divas. Yes, right? yes. On one, on one side, of course. Yeah. Um, so, on, and why not? Zio, that's my picture. My picture. My picture. Ich <laughs> Ja, nehmen wir den für die so. Ja, da haben wir noch zwei. Ja, da legst du her. Dann wollen wir das Ding. Ja. Das ist schick, gell? Das ist hier. Wo ist der Kopf raus? Wo ist der Hirn? Wo ist der Hirn? Das ist hier drinnen. Wo ist das hier? We have place for 14 people, nothing more. That means I invite somebody if I see that he has a talent, but if he would, will become an artist is a question. You never know, you know? It needs time. Sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it uh, needs 10 years. Sometimes it never will be. You're a very patient man. Uh, it's uh, life goes over 80 years. Uh, and not just for three months, you know? This is Gunther Schutzenhofer. He currently has a solo show at a gallery in New York. <laughs> I 
love his work because it doesn't look like anything that I know after doing this for 35 years. Was ist das, Gunther? Es ist ein Radio. Radio. Das ist ein Radio. Schusenhofer's work seems to have that uh, ability to transport diverse people in the same way that an inkblot test does. I've seen it over and over again. You look at something, someone, well, what is this image? And one person will say, oh, it's a radio. Oh, it's a car. Oh, it's an airplane. It's a comb. It's a, and everyone is, is bringing their own brain to the work. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. trying to put outside of art into a nice, neat little box. And it doesn't really fit in because it's something that happened independently. It's something that owes nothing to art history. And when you, have some, when you, when you owe nothing to art history, you really have a problem. This work that was not made with that trapping of you know, will I, get, will I get into one of the good galleries? Will I be in the Biennale? I mean, it's very nice that it's there. It, should, it deserves a place in the Venice Biennale. But at the same time, I don't want to be so much part of that whole, oh, what's the market doing? Because then you're like financial stocks. You should love it because it, it inspires you to love, not because people say, oh, this is safe now to love because it's, it's selling big. We can all get in on it, you know? Like, what is that? I don't want that. Well, you know, we had grand ambitions about 10 years ago that we were going to try to create a whole category at Christie's of outsider art. Unfortunately, there weren't enough investor speculator types who would be willing to um, fuel the market by reselling. That is, I think, one of the problems we had with creating uh, an auction category. Many of the passionate outsider art collectors are in some ways as obsessive as the artists they collect and uh, they love the works they have and they keep them. Aren't they beautiful? Yes, they are very beautiful. I, I've been collecting this group of cars probably for about 30 years whenever I could, either if they came up in auction or from private collections or wherever. Magic Girl was controlled by a spirit guide who she named as My Inner Rest. My Inner Rest. Yeah, course. but in My Inner Rest, I would think that these are a repeated self-portrait over and over and over again. There's an obsessive quality to many of these artists, and often, like the British outsider Madge Gill, they work in isolation. Where professional artists forge their creations in a dialogue with art history. The outsider is engaged in a monologue. One of the exciting things about seeing an outsider artist you've never seen before is that you've never seen anything like it before either, because each outsider artist is like an art movement of one, and they invent their own techniques, their own disciplines, their own ways of working, and their own visions. And that's why they come up with something completely individual each time. Now, this is a little picture by Joe Coleman. It's a self-portrait of Joe just after he'd carried out his autopsy on a dead body in a Hungarian hospital. And that's, that's him there. It's called The Pathologist. I couldn't afford his paintings. They're so expensive. There's big paintings about this big. So I said, oh, Joe, can you just do me a little tiny painting that I could just about afford? And so that's the one. Our little grandson, pretty frightened of it. Welcome to the auditorium.
I got kicked out of art school and then they asked me to be an advisor many years later after I had a certain following at that point. And so I said, okay, I, I'll be an advisor. So immediately I told the kid, get, get the fuck out of school because you're not going to learn a goddamn thing in that school. You have to go out there and live, you know, and that's where you're going to find your art, not in art school. At home, it was really pretty fucked up because, you know, my father was a pretty violent alcoholic and he tormented my, my mother and the rest of the family. And I found release and, and uh, relief in, in drawing. When I started painting, my brush strokes were bigger. And now, now I barely even move my brush and it's a one hair brush and I use jewelers lenses. I'm looking for more and more information on the surface of the painting. Even though it's coming out of somewhere, I mean, out there or, or in here, but it's appearing here and that's where I'm finding it. And the, the more minute that I look, the more that I find. I try to take care of the misfits, you know, and uh, the losers. The losers never get to write their side of history, except in my work. Joe Kilman's customers include Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio. Prices for his paintings have risen steadily, and there's now a waiting list. People want the work quicker than his one hair brush can paint it. In fact, such is his popularity, but in a peculiar twist, he's now banned from showing at the Outsider Art Fair on account of being too successful. What does this tell us? Perhaps it suggests we fetishize these artists. We prefer them to be poor and struggling. Across town lives one such artist who fits that bill. Hi, welcome to New York. Come in. Come in here. Yeah, now you can do. It's okay. When Iron Old Talpazan was still a boy in Romania, he had an encounter with what he believes was a UFO, which bathed him in a strange blue light. His life's work is an attempt to make sense of this. And this is uh, my spaceship UFOs. I work many size. I make this soy because the color, because this blue, color blue, for me represents double energy the inspiration me to create this uh, drawing, art, and everything. Second spaceship we for large. But it's still not finished in project because I'm a problem, financial problem, I can finish. Please. Maybe you like it. All my art, I do, uh, I, I do experiment. Look at the a lot of, lot of material. I broke a lot of things, a lot of canvas. The artist is like an astronaut. With the mind, you can travel the entire universe. Lionel's parents sold him for just under a hundred pounds when he was a baby. As a young man, he took drastic measures to escape the Ceausescu regime and swam the Danube from Romania to Yugoslavia, eventually finding refuge in the United States. He's lived in this one-room apartment in Harlem for 18 years. It was at the outsider art fair. I had a booth there, I used to show, show the outsiders work there, but Einel used to be outside in the snow every day, selling his artwork on the street. So in a way, Einel shot himself in the foot because he's, he was always outside selling his work for a fraction of the cost that I would like to have sold it for on my booth at the fair. 
Uh, I sell painting of May sometimes. Uh, I'm starting actually for $10 to sell. Sometimes a couple hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars sometimes. But it's not happening every day. I like to sell direct. No consignments, no contract, low. I need money. I need to write. Uh, this is the original in colors, the way I look my special here from. Actually, this position. I have uh, some uh, idea about vacuum. Somewhere like this. Take the vacuum, the vacuum transformation and energy, field system, field magnetic, anti magnetic uh, dimension. I know I have only one idea. I have six. You don't need it to make bomb atomic to destroy this planet. You need to use this source of energy to travel the universe forever. But it's different time, different space, different work. See? I do this way. My art is unique art. Unique mind, unique art on planet Earth. Lionel may be ploughing a lonely furrow, but then again, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus when he said the world was round. They all laughed when Edison recorded sound. The alternative guide to the universe is brimming with mavericks. Self-taught artists, unlicensed architects, fringe physicists, and visionary inventors. Hayward Gallery director Ralph Rugoff treated me to a private tour as it was hung. There's something about his movement. It's quite scary, isn't it? Do you know is a farmer in China who's taught himself how to make robots, using, again, whatever materials at hand. And he's made robots who commit suicide, robots who smoke cigarettes, robots who do the dishes for him. <laughs> and uh, this is a child robot. When you think about the idea of a child robot in China, given China's policy of only one child per yeah. family, who's going to be a sibling for all those yeah. single children? This is a remarkable French artist named Marcel Storr. These are all made in the 1970s. He was an orphan, he was deaf. He worked as a street sweeper in the Bois de Boulogne and he would go home at night and make these incredibly intricate drawings. And these were cityscapes he called megalopolises and this was his blueprint for the rebuilding of Paris, which he was convinced was gonna be destroyed in a nuclear attack. This was one of his last unfinished works. Oh. And I mean, it gives you a sense of how he worked, which is great. Incredibly detailed, the painstaking, elaborate lines that he's drawing, where they're so small, I can't even see them with, it, with my eye anymore, you know? Yeah. It's this idea also in this art, if you can't live in the real world, you know, or you're not happy there, then create an alternative reality for yourself. And that's what he seems to have done. Paul Lafley is an inventor of all kinds of devices. He was one of the assistant architects helping on the original World Trade Center in New York. And at a certain point, he went off in a different direction. It's good to be unknown for a long time because then you can actually, you know, pump up what you're doing and make it in, into a format where they, they can't destroy it. Because if you're in an art school, that's the worst place to go. That's the one thing I said to myself, never enter an art school. But I did go to an architectural school, but get, got kicked out after one year for conceptual deviance. <laughs> Paul came up with plans for a time machine where your body doesn't travel through time. You're just able to see what different times look like mentally you can project yourself you know i mean but stephen hawking said we'll see a, a time machine in the next 50 years Rafley says he had an encounter with alien intelligence that changed his life 
and that directed him to make this painting. And that if you put your hands, this is the left hand of the past, the right hand of the future. If you put your hands out on those two things and put your head forward, you're supposed to be able to download intelligence from another dimension. You look different. I'll let you know. <laughs> so this is a sort of injection of something. Also, you could see it in Venice as well. Uh, a, a different way of looking at the world, a sort of mutation of art and science and mathematics and mysticism. I think a lot of this work in this show harkens back to a kind of Renaissance moment when science and art weren't so different. If you think about Leonardo and Michelangelo, and they were they were making weaponry, they were thinking yeah. about flights, they were thinking, you know, about science as well as thinking about art. They were all engaged in the pursuit of knowledge and in understanding what it meant to be human, which is something contemporary artists lost sight of. We supposedly now we have experts who look after that for all of us. All these people in this show are people who decided they don't want the experts to look after it. They've got their own ideas about how this works. George Wider is the kind of person who will see a license plate and will make him think of a date. It'll be Thursday. He'll then think of every event he's ever read or heard of that happened on a Thursday with that number date. And he's made landscapes, whole cities, based on these ideas of time. George believes in this idea called the singularity which is that in the near future, machines will become intelligent, will have artificial intelligence. And a lot of people put this date at 2045, which now is starting to seem not that far away. I started to listen to this voice inside of me and stuff that was interested in these patterns. And it became, started to become very strong. You know, I was institutionalized uh, at one point, you know, because I uh, was uh, going over these things in my head over and over and over and over and over again. There's a thing called a magic square. These numbers, if you add them up this way, they add up to 34. If you add them up this way, they add up to 34, right? In all directions, they add up to an identical sum of 34. And in, in the case of this sculpture, all these, this 2, 17, 29, 11, 10, 5, and 13 add up to 70. And I create symmetrical patterns using the days of the week. And there's this linkage between the present, the past, and the future. What happened in the past was I was, you know, trying to do too much in my life. And I kind of got overwhelmed and went from being an engineering scholar to being uh, on the streets and stuff. Now I'm in galleries. I associate with dealers, art dealers. I show at art fairs. I sell my work. You know, so what to make of it? I don't know. You know, I don't think about it too much. You know? If you were to look at the Fridays of 1912, it's January 5, 12, 1926, February 2, 9, 16, 23, March 1, 8, 15, 22, 29, April 5, 12, 19, 26, May 3, 10, 17, 24, 31, so on, you know? So I, I, I see them in my head, they line up and stuff. And I feel um, that there will be huge technological changes in the future machines will be able to scan these very rapidly and see these interconnections and find this sort of interesting. They're going to need artwork too, the robots and machines of the future. So I'm simply making 
some work uh, for them and stuff to relax with and stuff. I'm just being useful, I think. That's what I'm doing, yeah. The Museum of Everything started life in a former dairy in 2009. It has an exceptional collection of outsider art, and just as revolutionary as the work is the way it's presented. With no fixed abode, it takes over spaces for a limited time only. The ramshackle, hand-knitted aesthetic is the work of Eve Stewart, the award-winning production designer of Les Mis and The King's Speech. It's playful and unpretentious, a million miles from the intimidating white space of most contemporary galleries. Here it is again, popping up in London, in Selfridges. Who else would think to stage an art exhibition slap bang in the middle of Oxford Street? This man pops up everywhere too. The museum's freewheeling director, James Brett. Now he is the ringmaster of the traveling circus as it hurtles across Russia, sniffing out secret works by unknown artists. This convoy has collected new work in four different Russian cities. And now it has come to a stop in Moscow for a huge show of that work a dash of the Kovas garage. This very graphic work is by Oleg Gordev, who's a, a street cleaner and a handyman, and he's a self-taught historian. And when you talk to him, actually, he was a really troublesome kid, and I think he narrowly escaped being in prison. And he's a sweet character. But obviously, as you can see in this group, there's a lot of Nazis. It's one thing to have one Hitler in your show. We've got two Hitlers. And that Hitler is what sort of sold me on him, because it's, it's, it's Hitler and he's just realized he's lost the war. And if you look at his features, you can see the pain. <laughs> this one, which is again, you know, same period, it, it's a Russian soldier seductively licking the cheek of a um, female Nazi officer. And there, there's something about the humor of the whole thing, but actually he's thrilled by these episodes of war. And I, I, somehow nobody else was doing it like that. Um, I certainly hope he's not a fascist, but I can't really tell. I have a really complicated relationship with this artist. The first time I saw her work, I was very confident, not for us, thanks very much, because it's too... It's too simple in its depiction of the world. But this woman is far from simple. And once I started looking at what, what she does, you happen to be pointing the camera at the ones that changed my mind. The artist, Pajova, she's about 80 years old. She's not skinny. And she lives in this apartment block and is very proud of what I think is 150 or so lovers that she's had during her lifetime. She's a very erotic woman. You know, you haven't just got animals doing it with their own species. You've got animals doing it with other species, and then things get worse. This is not a one-off or a two-off. There are hundreds of these pictures. It's not that these are masterpieces, but still, I'm in love with this picture. I mean, the two brontosauruses making out by the river is just phenomenal, and, and it probably has... <laughs> This artist you've got to look at. 
I mean, let's take a big look. This is a 15-year project of one man who goes every day to the park in Nishki Novgorod and paints the same or virtually the same landscape. And what he's documenting from the top of this to the bottom is the weather. My only sadness is we were only able to get a year off Victor. I was hoping for five years. The whole of this museum in Moscow couldn't contain all 15 years. It took us six months to persuade him to allow us to show it here. Partly because he said, well, look, someone's going to call up and they're going to need to know what was the weather March 2010. I said, no one's going to call you up. This is a great opportunity to communicate your life's work. There were very few contemporary artists who would spend 15 years on one project. He didn't even make it to the opening of the exhibition because he was afraid that he would miss a day of doing this. Статус самодеятельного художника повышается, что это не двоюродные братья. Я не вписана в как бы в контемпорарный процесс. С другой стороны, что значит аутсайд? Может быть, все мы, кого называют аутсайдерами, на самом деле самый самый не в, не в самом конце, а в самом начале. I love the word outsider at the beginning because, of course, I felt it associated with me and I, I, I can be weird. And I like that weirdness. I like my differences. But the more I looked into it, the more I thought this just can't be correct. I realized that the mainstream museums were using it to segregate. The other big thing for me is not to present it as the work of a bunch of crazy people. I mean, if I'm really frank, that's often the assumption. And so the other key issue is to say, look, Who's crazy? Who's disabled? Who's able? Why do we think that if someone has a mental health issue, it's just a cut and dry thing? Everybody has a mental health issue. It's a question of degree. And once you start to understand that, I think you take a step back into creativity and our reasons for making. Why do we create? Picasso said that every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain one once we grow up. Welcome to Prairie Gold Eye Center. Prairie Gold Eye Center is a good place. Yeah, let's go do it. San Francisco has always been a crucible for radical ideas. So it's no surprise that it's home to creative growth. Every day, more than 100 people that society calls disabled come here to make art. The notion was by the founders originally, Elias Katz and his wife Florence, that there's an innate creative <laughs> impulse in all humans. And given encouragement and materials, that will come out. Dan Miller was the first creative growth artist to have his work bought by New York's Museum of Modern Art. All right. For me, when I watch them work, you see a kind of anxiety and frustration, almost as if everything he needs to say is in his head and he's just really struggling with getting it out. Um, for most of us who are speech enabled, we were talking out and Dan doesn't seem to be able to, so he needs to draw it out and really hope that someone will understand, will get the translation, that will get the urgency of his message. Okay, that's the ball. Yeah. Right. Right, Jenny? Right, 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 right. right.
I love the atmosphere of this place. You can walk in off the street and just talk to the artist, buy a piece of work, or a limited edition comic book, or even a, a T-shirt. <laughs> Now, brown is the color of chocolate, which we all know and love. Taste that chocolate, and you cannot tell if it's made from Hershey, Cardelli, or Dove. For in that tasty chocolate delight, there is no black, there is no white. Oh, DJ Disco, that, that's me. The all star chocolate heroes. You created a whole new universe here. Oh, yes. Where did the All Star Chocolate Heroes come from? Well, a lot just came from my hand when I, when I decided to have some superheroes of my own. <laughs> and the comic book right here is going to help me start my own business in entertainment. And a lot of people, whether they're my family or friends, are really pr proud of me of working real hard on this one. Time to get busy up in here. Um, this is their crib. Their crib is where they live, I think. Yeah, yeah. Reed knows she's the type of arch enemy who hates, she hates everything to do with chocolate. He, he doesn't even like to, like to drink hot chocolate because he, he, he thinks that chocolate is no fun, but that's not really true. Chocolate can be fun. Now that you've captured Green Nose, let's head down to Mel's for a chocolate shake. Yes. So it all ends. That was their reward for capturing. Oh, here they are having their chocolate shake. I dedicate this one to all the ladies who have pretty feet and for, and for men and guys who appreciate women's pretty feet. They can uh, express how they feel like, like I have. They can say nice things about a woman's pretty feet in a sweet, positive, symbolized manner like I have. You can't quite see their feet, though. Well, I, I can, because I have good vision. And here's where their feet are at. Right now, I'm dealing with hair loss, but I'll have a plan to get my hair back. You've got a plan, eh? Mm hmm Let me know about it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Once upon a time, in a rough part of San Francisco, there lived a boy called William. He was different to the other kids. And they would tease him at school. He would walk home and try to ignore the drunk men shouting in the street. Sometimes he heard gunshots outside his window. He wished they would go away. Then one day, he came here and began to draw. He drew the people who had been shot back to life. He drew his city, but the way he wanted it to be. And he drew beautiful and strong women he'd never met. Sadhu right here, Sadhu right here, last long language, it's a Queen Sheba. See, she's a peacemaker, long language, the peacemaker, and she has beautiful eyes. Hey, I just got back from another world, and I it was across the mountain, edge of the sea, past the moon, beyond all things that we've dreamed about. You never in your life seen such colors that glows like a twinkle in an eye. The Museum of Modern Art in New York now has four of William Scott's paintings. He's also fond of making Halloween masks. And yes, that was him in Selfridge's window. William's been doing a series of paintings very recently um, about reinventing his life in the 70s. So William paints himself as either a successful basketball player or popular at the prom 
for with a happy, healthy family. And what he's doing is he's going back to those transformative years to make them better, to make his life today better, to make the disability go away, to make an injury to his body that he had then disappear. This is a me right here, that's me. I was on, on the beach at Santa Cruz Beach for a walk in another life of 1974, another life. Yeah, I'm gonna be like that. Uh, in, and wearing the afro, be like that. I want to be like that, wearing the afro with my with my new body, with my new body, uh, a a perf, a perfect body. That's Michael Jackson. Yeah. So you're on the front cover yeah. of Modern Painters. Yeah, that's right. That's a great picture. That's Christina. Dear Christina Hernandez, I have been single for a long time. I am tired being, it bothers me too much. I wanted a wife real bad. I've never have any kids. I wanted to become a father for good. Christina, I wanted you to be putting me into friendship and social skills. Yeah. Have you developed your friendship and social skills? No. You're pretty lovable, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's something very moving and powerful about this place. It feels like an environment where anything is possible. And there's room for wit, for charm, and for mystery and magic. Art is about looking at the world in different ways. It lets us see things through the eyes of its maker. And in doing so, it refreshes our own view of the world. It's a tonic for the imagination. Every one of these artists has created and inhabits their own world with such conviction that it becomes recognizable to us. And the best part of all is that we are invited to step inside. Okay, that's it. That's it, Jack. It's a wrap. What are we doing? All right. Huh. You can unmute your mics if you want to make any comments. <clears throat> I just love this. Amazing. It makes me feel like I could do art, you know? It just, right. <laughs> it's phenomenal. Thank great? you so much, Joe, for all these presentations. This was, for me, one of the most extraordinary. Yeah, same here. It was an amazing documentary. Really good. Uh, it was 
And uh, for those who don't know that, Welcome to My World is one of Baba's favorite songs. He used to like, he was singing it to people, Welcome to My World. And uh, he really loved that song. So uh, I was interesting to use it at the end. Okay, now you can go. I, I can't get it all on there. No. No. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's on um, yep. uh, the recording. Okay. So, Look at uh, that. What, what are you showing us, iPad? I'm trying to show Joe a squeaky, but I can't get it all on. Oh, a squeaky. Maybe there's a, part of it. There's an outsider artist this, that lives in uh, yeah, Georgetown uh, near us here in Merle Beach. Yeah, that's cool. What's yeah. the name of his town? Georgetown. Andrew. 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 I guess Andrew is where right. he lives. Uh, all right. Yeah, look at that. That's beautiful. I'll have to look, I'll make look some up. interesting things. Squeaky, okay. Nice. So we can take you over there if you want to take a little trip sometime. All right. Yeah. So we'll call him first. Uh, make sure he's there. It's his house that he that he. Uh, he lives in a trailer, but by the road he has an old car, and all around the old car is where he displays his paintings. That's great. And, and um, Andrews, right? Yeah. Squeaky from Andrews. Okay. Outside of Georgetown. Yeah, that's right. Cool. All right. And anybody else want to say anything before Thank we? Thank you. It was great. We love outsider art. Yeah, I, mean, I learned a lot just from uh, preparing for this. Definitely uh, a foray into people's psyches. <laughs> no, no. You know, so some of it was some way of, out there. Some of them have this compulsive detail, eye for detail and patience to do these. Yeah. yeah one of the last ones um the guy who was doing all numbers and math and all that yeah. ai <laughs> my thought is these are these are the guys the souls that have come here during avataric age to balance their head and heart yeah but they're trying to make planet earth to become uh, one of their planets one of their planets they seem like that one they're... ain't gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> no with robots in the future and all so maybe that's what he was used to yeah. From. Yeah. And then um, one of the artists, I can't remember the names, um, where he was taking um, pictures of nudes and drenching it in red. Yeah, that was, yeah, right. that was a little weird. <laughs> I, like, I like his, I like his drawings. Yeah. Good.